Hello, this is Michael Altos. We're continuing our discussion of cardiac physiology. This is recording part six. We're going to just review some cardiac arrhythmias. This is not an exhaustive discussion. Hopefully you've received that in other courses, but just a review of some of the most important common arrhythmias. The first is sinus bradycardia, usually less than 60 beats per minute. In some patients, this is not abnormal. For example, athletes have larger, stronger hearts, and with their large stroke volume, they can maintain cardiac output with a lower heart rate. Patients can also develop sinus bradycardia in response to vagal stimulation. Patients can have atrioventricular block, AV block, which is decreased or blocked conduction through the AV node. This can happen as a result of ischemia or scar scarring or inflammation or just a strong vagal stimulus. AV block is divided into different degrees. First degree AV block is just a prolonged PR interval, which is greater than 0.2 milliseconds, and usually no specific treatment is needed. Second degree AV block, which involves dropped beats, where a P wave occurs without a QRS following it, comes in two different types. Mobitz type 1, which is also called Wankybach. This involves progressive prolongation of the PR interval with each beat until finally it's so long that a ventricular beat is dropped altogether. We see here the PR interval is short, longer, longer, and then so long that there's no QRS at all, and then it's short again. These patients have some AV node conduction abnormality, but usually don't need any specific treatment. And often, if it's anesthesia related, it will get better on its own. Mobitz type 2 second degree AV block is a little bit different. First of all, these patients have a fixed number of non conducted P waves for each QRS. So we talk about it as like a 2 to 1 or a 3 to 2 ratio. This is an abnormality below the AV node in the His Purkinje system. And these patients often require implantation of a pacemaker to prevent complete heart block and cardiac arrest. So here we see PR. Same PR, same PR, dropped beat, P but no QRS. So this would be three and then one dropped. Third degree AV block, also called complete heart block, occurs in patients where there's no relationship between P waves and QRS complexes. The atrial impulses can't conduct all the way down to the ventricles, and so the ventricles are establishing their own pacemaker, usually the AV node or else something intrinsic in the ventricles. In this patient, if we measure, we can see P waves. This P, so we here's a P wave, here's a P wave, here's a P wave, here's a P wave, here's a P wave. There's actually one in the middle here, but we can't see it. Maybe that's it right there. So the P waves march out nice and regular, but there's no QRS following each P wave. We also have nice regular QRSs at a much slower heart rate, like we expect, but they aren't followed by a P wave. So the P's and the QRSs are doing their own thing. We also see the QRSs are wide, another sign that conduction is probably occurring outside the His Purkinje system. These patients often need a pacemaker to prevent cardiac arrest. Another thing we may see frequently are premature contractions. These are called extrasystoles or premature beats or ectopic beats. They originate from some ectopic focus, some place other than the SA or the AV node. And they can happen as a result of ischemia or plaques or mechanical irritation or medications. We usually talk about PACs and PVCs. PACs are premature atrial contractions. This is an early beat that originates in the atrium. It may have a diminished or an absent pulse because the heart hasn't filled all the way since it's an early beat, and so stroke volume will be low. They're narrow complex because they still conduct through the AV node and down the His Purkinje system. And because they have inserted themselves into the conduction system, they will cause a compensatory pause where the next beat is slightly delayed. These usually happen in healthy patients, although stress or caffeine, smoking or alcohol can cause an increase in the number of PACs. PVCs are a little different. They originate in the ventricle. Usually these patients have a widened QRS because the conduction isn't going through the His Purkinje system, but it's going directly through heart muscle from myocyte to myocyte. 
which is a little bit slower. These can be benign, or they can occur with stress, or they can be due to ischemic heart disease. And patients who are having large numbers of PVCs may be at increased risk for spontaneous VFib. Here's a PAC with a compensatory pause, and here's a PVC wide. Repolarization disorders are commonly associated with long QT syndrome. These are patients who may have electrolyte abnormalities or be on certain drugs that prolong the QT interval. You should be aware of some of these drugs, including antipsychotics, Zofran, and methadone. These patients are at risk for developing torsade, which is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which looks somewhat, something like this. The treatment is magnesium. Ventricular fibrillation is just uncoordinated, uncoordinated contraction and relaxation of the ventricular muscle. There's no move of blood out of the heart, and patients quickly become unconscious and can die in minutes. A sudden shock to the heart can cause a V-fib arrest, or else cardiac ischemia can lead to ventricular fibrillation. The treatment is chest compressions and ACLS, and ultimately electrical defibrillation. We also need to address whatever the underlying problem was. Atrial fibrillation is also a fibrillation, meaning uncoordinated contraction and relaxation relaxation. But in this case, it's occurring in the atrial muscle, and so we don't see any P waves on the EKG. Now, all of these little fibrillations don't get conducted to the ventricles because the AV node slows conduction, and any impulses that are conducted travel through the normal his Purkinje system. So we will see a normal rate of narrow complex QRSs, but they'll be irregular in timing. Sometimes patients can develop AFib with rapid ventricular response, RVR, that's when the heart rate's greater than 120, and those patients may need rate control to limit the number of impulses traveling into the ventricle. Many patients with AFib are treated with just rate control, but the irregular movement, or rather the uncoordinated movement in the atrium can lead to uh, some stasis and some pooling of blood in the atria. And at that point, there's risk for developing a thrombus or a clot. And that can eventually move through the ventricle and out the aorta and cause a stroke. So many patients on AFib are anticoagulated for life in order to reduce their risk of developing a thrombus or a clot. Other patients are converted out of AFib back into sinus rhythm. And this can be done with antiarrhythmic medications or electrical cardioversion. There are also procedures that can be done in the electrophysiology lab to try to stop the atrial fibrillation. Atrial flutter is related to atrial fibrillation. This is a large wave that travels quickly around the atrium at about 200 to 350 beats per minute. It's more coordinated than AFib. So AFib, you see, is just sort of this noisy baseline with no P waves and a QRS coming out every now and then. Atrial flutter is much more regular and it has this sawtooth pattern um, with usually every certain number of beats being conducted out of the atria into the ventricles. Often these patients have a rate around 150 beats per minute, and it's this sawtooth appearance with a 2 to 1 or a 3 to 1 conduction between the atria and the ventricles. Bundle branch blocks involve interruption of conduction through one of the branches of the bundle of His. Patients can have a right bundle branch block, which often occurs with no underlying pathology and usually doesn't pose a lot of concern to us. A left bundle branch, on the other hand, seems to be associated more with structural heart disorders or ischemia. And patients who have a left bundle branch can be very hard to diagnose an MI on their EKG because of the artifact that the bundle branch causes. This is just a demonstration of the common uh, structures that we see on the EKG in a right and a left bundle branch. The right bundle branch tends to have an RSR prime in V1, so there's your, you won't really see a Q here, so we see R, S, and then another big R. 
And in the lateral leads, they tend to have small Q's and S's, the big R, the Q, R, S, with this widened S wave over here. That's a right bundle branch. Left bundle branch is a little bit opposite. They have a, not much of a Q. Uh, they have a little R, sorry, they have not much of a Q in this one, a little R and then a very big scooping S in V1. And here you can see that rabbit ears in the R in V6. That's it for our discussion about EKG abnormalities. Please let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you again in the next recording.